Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, welcome to King City Bible Church, uh, to all who are seated here, and uh, we extend uh, that welcome to those who are viewing our live stream uh, this morning of our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, we also say a welcome to those who are viewing uh, the recording of this service uh, on our Facebook, on our uh, YouTube uh, page, rather, and uh, welcome to all, We're praying that today's word uh, will go straight uh, to the heart, uh, that it will uh, cause us to be changed, uh, transformed, uh, brought into a deeper and richer relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I would say as we uh, start this morning, just a, uh, my heart is feel filled with gratitude for all those who uh, worked throughout this past week and then uh, yesterday uh, to clean uh, the inside of the building and uh, the property uh, outside. Uh, it looks uh, wonderful. A uh, special thank you to our uh, friends uh, from Gethsemane Church uh, who uh, provided many hands. Uh, we have a family from Awana who came and, and did much work and our own people here uh, within the congregation uh, working indoors and out and uh, what a what a wonderful blessing it is to see so many hands uh, work together, and uh, what a blessing. Uh, the grounds look uh, quite nice, better than they have in, in some time, uh, and we're so grateful for it. Uh, just keep in mind and keep in prayer, uh, Gethsemane will hold their first service here in this building next Sunday. Uh, so keep uh, the uh, congregation uh, in prayer. That's uh, it's, a, it's an incredible thing. Uh, we've had to wait a, a year for this, but the Lord's timing is perfect, and uh, we will uh, look uh, forward to that. And I think, uh, I think at least Bruce and I will be present during that first uh, service here, so that should be uh, interesting. I hope I don't have to say anything. Can I just be a spectator that day? I hope so. That would be, that would be lovely, uh, and then just enjoy that. Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we uh, begin uh, this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for uh, the beauty uh, of the weather outside uh, and our surroundings. Thank you, Lord, for being unchangeable. Thank you, Lord, for being unshakable. Uh, we're just so grateful. Nothing catches you off guard. You are not caught uh, by surprise. Your eyes range throughout the earth. You uh, have your ear bent toward us. You, you know us inside and out, Lord. You know where we're at in our walk with you today. Lord, uh, meet us uh, where uh, we are. Uh, help, help communicate to us through your spirit in a way that we can understand. You know the situations that we're dealing with. You know what's upon each and every one of our hearts, Lord. We uh, uh, look forward expectant of uh, 
you doing great and, and mighty things. Uh, well, within our hearts, individually, but within this church as well, uh, corporately, and uh, we're just so grateful uh, for all of it. Uh, we just uh, pray that your spirit would guide us through your holy word this morning and uh, that we would take from it. We, we don't want to leave here the same as we were, Lord. We, we want to be moved. Uh, we want to be brought into a, a closer relationship with you. We want to walk closer. We want to talk more with you. And we want to hear more from you. So uh, may that be so, Lord, as we go forward. May uh, everything that we do here today, Lord, uh, bring glory, <clears throat> excuse me, and honor to your name and to your name only. Would you be preparing our hearts for our observation of communion? following the message, Lord, this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we find ourselves uh, in the Gospel of Mark once again, uh, chapter 7. In fact, we're looking at the uh, last portion of Mark chapter 7 this morning, verses 31 through 37, and uh, I'll read from that. Mark chapter 7, uh, beginning in the 31st verse, uh, and this continues right from where we left off last time. Uh, and you remember the impact that the Lord Jesus made in the life of this Gentile woman who had great faith. Uh, but then the Lord Jesus left uh, the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. And there, are some uh, there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Uh, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his words for our hearts this morning. Amen. We know, uh, and I've probably said it over and over again, that the Gospel of Mark is the Gospel of the servant, the servant of the Lord. And in our portion here this morning, uh, there are the signs of how the Lord Jesus was working and operating in this particular miracle, this healing of the deaf and mute man. And, you know, they're actually the signs of how people knew he was the servant of the Lord, the Messiah. But they're actually also signs to identify us as believers, you know, as we serve the Lord in this present time. So in these verses, we find a man who was both deaf and mute. He couldn't hear. He couldn't speak. So this poor man couldn't ask any questions. He couldn't hear any answers or any explanations to a question. He probably couldn't, I would imagine, that he couldn't read uh, because of his lack of speech and hearing. So in a spiritual sense as well, this man couldn't read the scriptures. He couldn't understand perhaps or maybe grasp the truths that you and I are uh, so uh, privileged to learn ourselves, and it's uh, likely in the society that the Lord Jesus lived in that there would have uh, been many who have seen, um, you know, this as more than just a physical disability of the senses, but would have seen this man as being possibly demon-possessed, right? You know, that, that the devil had somehow afflicted him for some reason, whether it was for his parents' sins or for his own sins, right? However we describe or however we understand this man here this morning in the text, 
one thing would be clear to us that he, in this time, in this society, he had a miserable and hopeless existence. And um, I think that what we're given here by the Holy Spirit of God here this morning is a very graphic picture of what a sinner is. You know, we, we know that these miracles that the Lord Jesus performed, each and every one, they're parables and action often is the case, right? You know, sinners are just like this man, cut off, right? That's what sinners are. The Bible tells us that sinners are, uh, what, dead in their transgressions, right? But we hear from the Apostle Paul, you know, we're cut off from God as sinners. We're also cut off in the sense that we can't communicate with the Lord the way we were created to. Psalm 66 Verse 18 tells us that if we cherish sin in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us, right? Now, uh, I certainly don't want to say, and I'm not saying, that God doesn't ever hear the prayers of an unsaved person or a person who has sin in their life. No, no, no. If, if, if there's a prayer and it's according to God's will, what would stop God from answering any prayer that's according to his will yeah. and purpose, you know. But I would say there is no guarantee or promise that God should hear those prayers. And in certain instances, he doesn't. And it's as if, what do we, what do we read of uh, in the Old Testament, right? In the book of Deuteronomy. Then for sinners, you know, it's, it's like the heavens are, are bronze to them, right? Blocking all Prayers, you know, if it's in that sense that we're living in that lifestyle of habitual sin, we're cut off from God. And that involves communication, but it also involves connection. You know, we can't connect to God. And of course, we can't connect to God's people. You know, Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 tells us, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So it's something for us to keep in, in mind here this morning. Uh, you know, we see this man. He is both deaf and mute. And what an illustration of what it is to be a sinner cut off from the life of God cut off from dialogue with God, and cut off from any connection with God. That's the life of the sinner. And boy, that's a pitiful sight. And uh, so it is with this man. But, but the message of this particular miracle is that there's good news. And the good news is the compassion of the Savior, our Lord Jesus, who came to this man where he was, and he made him whole again, right? It's fantastic. And so this morning, you and I, we as believers, we need to see sinners as they really are. Those who have not committed their lives to Christ Jesus, right? You know, they're cut off from the life of God. They're cut off from communication with God. They're cut off from connection with God and with God's people. But we also need to see at the same time the wonderful, compassionate Savior who came to where this man was. And uh, he comes to where all sinners are, right? To meet their need. Do you remember when you were living only in sin? Do you remember when the Lord met you where you were? Do you remember where the Lord met you? You know, not only did the Savior love this man, oh, it's so evident that he did, but others loved this man. Others brought this man to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we see that right there in the beginning of our text this morning. There were people who brought to him, to our Lord and Savior, this man. Now, we don't know exactly how this happened. Uh, we do know that the miracle took place in the region of the Decapolis, which is, you know, we know, and you probably see in your notes there, geographically, a place of ten cities, right? And back in uh, Mark, actually, you might recall, back in uh, Mark chapter 5, 
uh, you know, the, uh, the demoniac, right? He went back to the Decapolis, that same region, to tell of the great things that the Lord had done for him. He went and told the people of the compassion that the Lord had on him. And it may, and I'm just, you know, speculation only, it may well be that the friends of this deaf and mute man that we're reading about this morning, maybe they had heard of the miraculous deeds of the Lord Jesus toward that man, toward that demon-possessed man. You know, you remember that was a man with perhaps more than uh, 2,000 demons possessing him. I don't know what the number was. We're not told. It does, but maybe that gave them a bit of encouragement. Maybe that give, gave them a bit of hope. Maybe that gave them a bit of enthusiasm that this miracle man from Galilee, right, maybe, just maybe, could meet their friend's needs. So whatever the case, they had heard somehow of the power of the Lord to change and transform lives, and this man's friends brought him to Jesus. And that's what we uh, have to be doing, you and I. Uh, I don't know if you have, I would trust that you, like myself, have unbelieving friends, right? Those who we know well, we love, we care about them, they have not given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. They haven't made that commitment. They haven't accepted him as Savior. They have not believed. They have not repented. You know, but what are we supposed to be doing? We're, we're, we have to be seeking to bring them to the Lord Jesus. We have to be uh, beseeching, imploring. You like how I look to my wife when I'm looking for vocabulary? <laughs> right? Because I do that all the time, Right? If I look to my wife or my daughter, I'm sure to get the vocabulary word that I need. We need to be beseeching. We need to be imploring the throne of grace that the Lord might reach out and touch them and change and transform lives. So this story that we read of this morning and these, this little portion of verses that we're reading, I think it has a twofold application that I'm going to seek to give us in the time that we have. It applies to those who find themselves in a similar situation to this deaf and uh, mute man, cut off from God, cut off from communication with God, connection with God, and God's people. Uh, but it, I think it also applies to us uh, as believers in Christ Jesus that we need to touch people in the world, and it tells us how we can touch them how we can serve them, and how we can win them uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, which is part of our great, it is the great commission, right? You know, it's the call and the purpose that we have as believers. So, that to say, uh, the first thing that we see this morning beautifully is the servant of the Lord's touch, the touch of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 33 of Mark chapter 7 says, After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, then he spit, and he touched the man's tongue. And I would say, now, I'm with you. I'm with you. That is a strange and elaborate behavior, right? You know, in fact, I would say it's unique. You know, you don't find the Lord Jesus doing anything like that in any of the other gospel records. But the thing is, the Lord Jesus has his own methods. And here, and I have to remind myself of this, if we pray that the Lord would work in our lives, that the Lord would work in the lives of those whom we love, right? You know, as this man's friends did, in a way, in verse 32, we have to be actually open to the Lord answering prayer in his way. Answering our prayers, but in his way, his methods, right? You know, and, and now, listen, there, there's only, and we know this, there is only one way, and one way only to be saved, and that's the way of the cross. But there are many different paths or ways that leads to that one way, which is the cross, right? What I'm saying is God often brings us all, you know, 
he brings us by all different and, and varied means to get to Calvary, right? You know, you think of each miracle that he performed, they're all a bit different, right? They're all a bit particular, varied in the way that he performed them, unique to each situation of the individual. You know, and it's by those varied means that we get to Calvary and bow in humility and uh, admit our sin and uh, receive the Savior. Hey, God might be moving in a mysterious way in your life today. I don't know. I don't know what your particular situation is. It may very well be the case that he's moving in quite a mysterious way. You might think strange or elaborate way uh, in your own life today. I would say don't question what God's doing in your life presently. Don't fight against him. But what we need to do is exactly what this man did, which was submit to him, surrender to him, and just let him have his way with your life. You know, the, the Lord Jesus deals with this man very differently than he does anyone else. And only Mark records this incident. You know, so that tells us that God deals with us individually. And maybe that's a lesson for us in how you and I are meant to deal with those in the world who don't believe. Our friends and our loved ones who don't believe. You know, people who are, you know, in this dark world, they need to be dealt by with us individually. Uh, you know, we need to use uh, we need to use different tools for different problems. But the Lord does this uh, in our own lives, doesn't He? When He's working with us, He He brings different circumstances to to bear on different people in order to bring them close to Himself. Um, you know, I I know you've experienced the. The touch of the servant of the Lord uh, in your own life, you know, but, you know, what will do you? Do you recognize the servant's touch in your own experience? You know, there might be someone who doesn't. You know, what if, if, you know, you might say, well, how do I know? How do I know if Christ is touching my life at present? You might even be thinking as a believer this morning, you know, if we're trying to win people for the Lord, how do we know? When the Lord's touching their lives? Those are good questions. You know, if we look at verse 33 of Mark chapter 7, we see Jesus take this man aside. We see him take him away from the crowd. You know, the Lord separates people from the crowd when he begins to work in their lives. Now, in a literal sense, you know, the Lord, you know, uh, this man's lot in life was probably one we would think in the society of embarrassment. Right, And perhaps the Lord didn't want to embarrass him any further, and so he separated him from the crowd. But I would think the spiritual application here for all of us is because when the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives and he moves in conviction of sin, what does he do? He separates us from the crowd. You know, the, the, thing, it, the things we used to take pleasure in, Right? We don't find pleasurable anymore, or at least we shouldn't. Right? You know, he begins, to, in other words, he begins to take us away from our love of sin. Right? You've experienced this. You remember probably where you once were and how drawn you were to sin, whatever that particular sin or, or your sins were. Right? You know, but, you know, he begins to take us away from that, from the rest of the crowd, because he's preparing us for something better. He's preparing us to fall in love with the Lord Jesus. And there's no room for those other things in our hearts when we have a heart for him. So maybe you find yourself in a position where the things of sin that you used to love and appeal to you, they no longer appeal to you, right? The things that you used, you know, remember the things that you used to kind of cringe at? You know, maybe you, you balked at such things, you know, are the things that now as a believer and in your person, now you're being drawn toward those things. More and more as you grow in Christ, 
you're drawn toward those things. And, well, friends, listen, that's a sure sign that the Lord's beginning to touch you, that he's separating you from the crowd. You know, you're beginning to feel different from the crowd. God's making you different. That's what we're supposed to be. You know, we need to first pray that the Holy Spirit will work in conviction. And uh, uh, that's what uh, the Lord Jesus promised in the Gospel of John, uh, that this one who would come after him would convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. So we need to start seeing we need to start seeing sinners as they are. We need to bring them to Jesus, pray for the Lord to work in their lives, specifically by bringing conviction of sin to them, separating them from the crowd. So the Lord Jesus, having brought him aside, put his fingers into the man's ears and spat and touched this man's tongue. Listen, friends, this is the thing. Not only does he separate us from the crowd, but you know, when he's working in our lives, but he begins to communicate to us in a way that only we understand, right? You know, why did the Lord thrust his fingers into this man's ears? You know, because that was the man's disability. You know, he was deaf. He couldn't hear anything the Lord was saying. So the Lord was letting him feel it. The Lord was letting him sense it. It was literally... It was literally sign language in a very, I mean, right? You know, this was the sign of the Lord Jesus, the servant of Jehovah, to this man. By, by putting his fingers into this man's ears, he was communicating to him, I'm going to make you hear. I'm going to make you hear. You know, why did he spit and touch this man's tongue. Well, you know, he, he's telling the man what, in this case, he can't do through dialogue. He's telling him in that instance, I'm going to make you speak. I'm going to make you speak. So the message was being communicated to this man by the Lord's touch in a way that this man could understand. You know, everybody else was probably, you know, they were dismayed, right? You know, they didn't understand, and maybe, maybe that's the case, that no one understands uh, what's going on in your life, but you know, you know that God's communicating, right? You absolutely know it. He's communicating to you. No, everyone else might be dismayed, stunned, shocked even, but you know, and this is what the Lord Jesus did in his life. He touched people in a way that they understood that maybe no one else could appreciate. Maybe that's the case for you too. No one else might appreciate it, but you know, this is the Lord's way of meeting you where you are in a way that you would understand in your particular situation. You know, back in uh, Mark chapter one, uh, uh, verse 41, we see that there the Lord Jesus, he's filled with compassion again, right? And he reached out and he touched the man with leprosy. Well, I mean, come on. People weren't allowed to touch lepers. It would make them unclean. We know that. And yet we see the Lord Jesus touching, literally, the, the literal meaning of the word touching there is embracing or grabbing. So I love that. He's, he's embracing, he's grabbing onto a leper and healing him. Literally, he took hold of him is what we see there. You know, a man who hadn't known the touch of friends or family. He'd been, you know, banished from the community, from the society, from the congregation of Israel. And then the Lord Jesus grabs hold of him. And the communication by that embrace is, I love you. Right? That's the Lord. The Lord's just communicating to this man what no one else would or could. But I love you. You know, all in just grabbing hold of him. And I, you know... Um, is the Lord grabbing hold of you? Is he grabbing hold of you? you? You and I, we need to communicate to believers today in a way that they understand. And it's through, it's through a touch of compassion. And I know, I know full well, it sounds strange because we're living in times where touching others is very difficult. We've been separated and isolated from others. And it's a trying time. And it continues. 
unbelievably. It's so hard. And yet, I, and yet we can still touch others' lives because it's, it's love. It's an amazing love, right? You know, the Lord Jesus could have just willed for this man to be healed. We know that. The Lord could have spoken the word, you know, whether the man heard it or not, right? And he would have been healed instantly, right? But he chose to touch the untouchable. He chose to, you know, what he always did, to love the unlovely, you know, and he chose to do it in the full sight of everyone in society because he, in a sense, he's saying to this man, I understand what you've gone through all your life. In a sense, actually, the Lord Jesus could say, I know what it feels like to be, to be you. The Lord Jesus could say, I want to make it right. You know, and that's, that's the servant's touch. But, you know, we, we don't only want to see his uh, touch this morning, but we also want to see his look. Verse 34 of Mark chapter 7. Look, where the, look what the Lord did. He looked up to heaven. He literally, he focused or he contemplated upon heaven. That's where he looked. He looked up to heaven. And with a deep sigh, he said to him, Fatha, which means be opened. You know, why did the Lord Jesus look up to heaven? We have to remember this man couldn't hear, right? And he was, again, signing to the man where his help would come from. Psalm 121, verses uh, 1 and 2. Psalm 121, beginning in verse 1, I lift my eyes up to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, God said, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Right? You know, the Lord Jesus was showing by looking up to heaven where the source of power for this miracle would come from. Man, some people are just too proud to look uh, to another. There are some people who are too proud to look outside of themselves. You know, they're, you know, they're looking for the hero inside of themselves or they're looking for some... Uh, they're looking for some saint that'll come out of themselves by you know, following some sort of uh, uh, an ethic or some kind of religious code. But what we see clearly is that our help must come from the Lord. He must save us, right? Amen. He has to. Some people are too proud to accept salvation as a gift. They want to contribute something to it, right? But where does salvation come from for people? It comes from heaven, right? I mean, that's it. Therefore, it necessitates all the more that we go to heaven for the power and we come in prayer because our power comes from heaven and people's salvation will come from heaven. So we're meant to point them to heaven. And if we're going to win people like the Lord Jesus, won over this deaf and this mute man, we don't just need to touch them with a servant's touch, but we need to look at them with the servants look and I don't know how it is we look at those who are unbelievers who just haven't given their lives to Christ yet but I'll tell you this because we know from reading the word of God that it's going to be a look of compassion that wins them right mm -hmm. it has to be I don't know if that's how we look at them but is it a look of love yeah. is it a look of love that we're giving others that just don't know the Lord. They're lost. Mark 7 verse 34 tells us that the Lord looked to heaven. and But that's not it. He sighed deeply. Now this was, this was inaudible in a sense to the man because he couldn't hear. But visually there was something being communicated. And that word sigh that we see there in verse 34, it speaks of a of a heaving of Christ's chest. You know, the Lord Jesus, as he breathed, his chest expanded and he exhaled to heaven. And this man could see that the Lord was moved in compassion because of his condition. I think that's beautiful. 
You know, he was communicating in his sigh, this deep sigh, I care about you. I care about you. And you, if there's anyone wondering, you know, does the Lord Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. Yes, he cares. You know, th this man saw his deep sigh of compassion, you know, and this deep sigh that we read of here, it, it, it speaks of a, a groaning in the spirit. It's a, um, it's a troubled groan, and it actually comes from an ancient, and I found this fascinating, it actually comes from an ancient Greek word that describes the snorting of a horse. And, I, and please, I, I don't mean this irreverently, not in the least, but it, I, I think in that it graphically communicates what we're seeing here. It's, it's as if there was this involuntary gasp, a trembling, where the Lord Jesus breaks down in a sigh because of this man's terrible condition. Uh, it's just, it's really beautiful. I mean, it's just a gra the sigh of compassion. It's a cry of compassion. And then, of course, one day the whole world would see the servant of the Lord die in compassion, right? And all of our sorrows will be laid upon him, all of our pain and our suffering laid upon uh, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then, um, then again, uh, on Golgotha's hill, on that Roman cross, his chest would heave once more with, uh, with breathless spurts as he hangs. He's nailed to that tree. And, you know, it's, I, I think that's part of what we come in remembrance of today. You know, Christ's compassion didn't just bring this man to his feet, but it brought potentially the whole world to his feet. And uh, of course, I pray that it's brought you and I uh, to his feet and to be able to see that deep sigh that he has over you, over me, over, over all who are, are troubled and in that awful, terrible condition, just seeing the Lord Jesus cry you know, over all of us. The same word, uh, incidentally, well, not the exact same word, but the root of the word uh, carries over there into Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and uh, which says, Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but... The Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. By the way, the, the intention behind that word, I don't know if I'm walking, I'm used to walking, I'm walking out of the camera, but, but, there, but that word for intercedes, I mean, I don't have time to preach on this today, but it means he hype, it's like, it's hyper intercession, he super intercedes, and that's a whole nother, that's a series of messages, my friends on the blessings that we get through the Holy Spirit's intercession. But anyway, there's a sigh that you and I, that we can experience in prayer where we don't have words with which to pray any longer. It's that point where our hearts are just breaking and our souls just being poured out to the Lord. And that's where, when we read in this verse, it's where the Holy Spirit just rises up within us to intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with these emotional sighs that are just too deep for words. I don't know if you've ever experienced that in prayer, but that I, I you know, I, I'm I'm thinking that that's what's needed if we're going to see people touched and a and a world transformed. This man here that we read of today, he was in he was a Gentile. And he was in a Gentile region. He was cut off from God's people. And the Lord had to come in a different way, touch him, look upon him, and sigh over him. And, and like Paul, um, like Paul, we're going to have to agonize in spiritual labor pains, right? To see people born again, right? Galatians chapter 4. Um, now... 
all of these gestures from the Lord, it was accommodating to this man. The Lord was coming down to where this man was, to his level. He was communicating compassion through sign language that he could understand. He took him aside. He looks at him in whatever, the disability, his inhibitions, his embarrassment, whatever he was experiencing, his shame or fear, but the greatest sign that ever communicated God's love. We know and we're remembering today was Calvary, right? We just know it. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While, it's, it's amazing every time you read it, right, friends? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That doesn't lose anything, does it? it it's amazing every time you read those words or think upon them. You know, that's the ultimate sign that we're to take in this world. And we we got to take that sign just out into the world. You know, we have to. And how are we to take it? Well, that's a little harder. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, Colossians 1, 24, Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body which is the church. Don't misunderstand that. The sufferings of Christ were complete, absolutely sufficient to transfer righteousness and forgiveness to every believer. Paul's sufferings were meant to be an example of Christ and a testimony to his converts that his ministry was absolutely sincere. Paul's kind of saying, this suffering that I'm experiencing in my flesh out of love and compassion for the lost, to win them to Jesus, is communicating the love of Christ in my body to them. Here's the deal. People can't press rewind, right? And, and they can't, you know, go back in time and see what Jesus suffered on the cross. But they can see what we're willing to suffer, you and I, to bring them to the Lord. I mean... When I think about that, it is just so, oh, it's convicting, but it's just so powerful. It really is, you know, what we need to seek to bring them to Christ. We need to pray for them that the Lord would move in their life to bring conviction, to separate them from the crowd, to communicate to them in a way that they understand. And we need to see that their source of help is from heaven and we need to look at them with a look of love and a look of compassion and we need to agonize in prayer that struggle in prayer that they might be born again and then we need to suffer to sacrifice like what time money energy tears sleep i don't know maybe all of it right i just you know, so we, we see the servant's sigh. We see the Lord Jesus, the servant of Jehovah. We see his look. We see his touch. And then we also, then we find his word. The Lord Jesus looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to the man, Ephatha, which is an Aramaic word, which means be opened or released. And it's this, it's this power of the spoken word of God. The man couldn't hear the word. He was deaf. But it's so incredible. You know, he couldn't hear, therefore he couldn't obey. But the power of Christ was in his word. And it was the power of Christ that supernaturally opened the man's ears. It supernaturally loosened this man's tongue. And the cool thing is, is that, you know, creation at that point, heard the Creator's voice. Wow, how powerful is that? It's incredible. And you know, and you know some, there's some of you who may be hearing this, uh, you've known the touch of Christ in your life, you, you've known His look. Maybe you've even heard Him sigh over you. You know He loves you. You know He died for you. You know He wants to save you. You know the truth and all of that, but then you just didn't take that next step. You just haven't embraced it and truly grabbed hold of it. And that's the thing. Until you embrace it 
Until that moment when you embrace it, you'll never be set free. Saving power is in God's word. If you hear his voice, if you hear his voice personally to you, then by all means, let me, let me urge you to embrace it. Embrace God's word to you. Believe, right? You know, and then we as believers, we need to give people the word of God. Why do we give people the word of God? Oh, we know it, friends, because the word of God, the power of God that brings salvation is the gospel, right? It's right there. You know, we just know it. God's word. We need to see those who don't believe, you know, the way they are and they're lost. And I think I think even in these days, especially that are our, how much have we looked to ourselves you know, in, in these days, in this year that we've, that we've gone through, you know, have we kind of lost sight of what those who don't believe, you know, what they really are lost and where they're heading, which is heartbreaking, heart-wrenching. It's, you know, it's, we, we, need, we need to see it again I feel like we may have lost a little. And maybe I'm just speaking, you know, for myself. I don't know. I don't know where you are with that. But we need to see that the only answer is God's word. That's it. We have to touch them, to look upon them, to love them, to have compassion upon them, to struggle in agonizing prayer for them and to sacrifice for them to give them the word and Listen, I'll be honest with you. I'm not doing it. Not well, right? I don't know if any of us are, how many of us are, you know, but I can speak for myself, you know. It's not always there, you know. And, uh, but I do know this. I, I know we need to start doing it if people are going to be one, if people are going to be one for Christ. You know, I do know that. This man had faith in Christ. This man had faith in Christ enough to trust him as he, as he placed some of his saliva on his tongue. I mean, you got to trust someone if that's going to happen. This man was changed. And for everyone listening to you, you can be changed. God, God will do it. He's the one who changes and then the Lord told everyone in verse 36 of Mark chapter 7 not to tell anyone about this miracle. Why? Well, you know, he was in a Gentile region. He, we know that he wanted to minister first to the Jews, so he wanted to keep that avenue open to do that. And then, of course, he didn't want to be uh, flocked there and then with all sorts of people with different ailments. You might recall that he had gone into the vicinity to uh, have a rest, but we find that the people couldn't keep quiet. In fact, the word of God tells us that the, the more he told them not to, the more the news spread. Don't tell them. No, no, it spread all the more. You know, and you could, and you could see this happen. If you were to look back in Mark chapter 1, and Mark chapter 3, and Mark chapter 5, we've seen this before, right? You know, you could look back, you know, we see the same thing. People who know the touch of the Lord Jesus, who experience the power of his word, their lives are changed forever, and they can't keep it in. They can't contain it. What do you mean, keep it quiet? You know, they, they can't contain it, and it wasn't long before everybody came to see him. And a large crowd, we read, gathered bringing their lame, bringing their blind, bringing their crippled, and the Lord Jesus took time to heal them all. I mean, you know, the, the result was that the Gentiles, now I'm going back to Matthew 15, we were looking at a portion of that last week to fill in some gaps. Matthew 15, the second part of verse 31, it tells us, as far as the Gentiles, they praise the God of Israel. That's the result. They praise the God of Israel. I love that. Mark chapter 7, verse 37 says, People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, listen, 
if, if they lived this side of uh, Calvary, like we do, they would have said it with even deeper conviction and feeling, right? He has done everything well, right? You know, we can say that. He has done everything well, perfect. You know, I don't know if there's anyone who's afraid of trusting uh, in Christ this morning. Uh, you know, for, for, you know, we've talked this morning about those who haven't embraced that truth yet, for those who don't yet believe, you know, and maybe it's just the fact that they think, you know, if I do this, if I take this step and make the commitment and embrace and surrender, you know, he's going to mess up my life. You know, but I, there are people here, this, for, for anyone who's watching this morning, or maybe some of you know, you know, there are people present here this morning, you know full well that's not the case, that he will not mess up your life, but he'll give you life to the full, abundant life, overflowing because, why? You can all say it, because my Jesus has done things well, right? He's done things well. He's done everything well. Boy, we can proclaim that. He's done everything, all things well. He's never made a mistake. He's never failed, never. But, you know, I would say often is the case, friends, we're afraid to offer the Lord Jesus to people, you know, and we, we need to tell them that they have to turn from that sin, repent, turn away from it, turn toward him, but we also need to tell them that the Lord Jesus Christ will do everything well in their lives. What a message to give people. The Lord Jesus will do everything well in their lives. Oh, it's not necessarily an easy life. No, 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 no. I don't need to repeat the. We know the troubles will be there. There will be trials, there will be temptations, there will be tests. There will be fires that we need to go through and waters that we must go through and so on. There will be all of it, valleys of many kinds, terrains of different and paths of different kinds that we'll have to travel. But I tell you this, he'll still do everything well and everything right in our lives. He'll make the difference. He will. You know, and maybe the problem, I guess maybe the if we're not carrying that message to people, then maybe the problem is he's not making a difference in our lives. Because if he's making a difference in our lives, well, certainly we would want to carry that message to others. And maybe it's the case. I've been reminded that we need to become hands-on servants again. You know, what's needed is the touch, the look, the sigh, the word, those are the signs of our Lord and Savior. Those are the signs of the servant of the Lord. And I guess the question would be, are those the signs of our lives, in our lives, that we follow this Savior, that we're ministers in this world, and that we're going to continue to proclaim unashamed the gospel the name of Christ Jesus. It's going to make a difference in people's lives. The Lord Jesus Christ, he went to the cross, as we've spoken of this morning. It was an ultimate sign, wasn't it? What an incredible thing. We're going to come to the table, and we're going to partake of these elements and we're going to do this in remembrance of him who gave his life, that sacrifice, so that we might live. Amen. Right? You know, we're here to, to live. And it's not just any life, but it's life to the full. going to read uh, the Apostle uh, Paul's words. Uh, before, I, before I do, let me quickly uh, take us to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we, uh, as we come and uh, we uh, take these elements, Lord, you, you know where our hearts are and you know where we are. You meet us every time where we are. You come and, and meet our every need. 
You know exactly the way we need to be communicated to that we would understand. Others might not see it. Others might look and be, uh, be dismayed and stunned at what you're doing in our lives. But, but we know. We know that you're communicating to us. And Lord, uh, I pray that we would have uh, ears that are open to hear your word to our hearts today. Lord, uh, there might be some things we need to take care of as we partake of these elements, Lord. Things that we need to confess that are on our hearts. We need to just give them over to you. Lord, uh, you're the one who can expose those things. Uh, I don't know why we try to hide them, but we do. Put a, bury them deep in the depths and darkness of our hearts that we don't understand. But you see it. And Lord, we need to have those things dragged out into the light, exposed. We need to have that conviction, Lord. And know that it's something that we need to take care of, give to you. Put at the foot of the cross so that you can pick it up. We're too weak, Lord, but you can pick it up with your mighty arms and you can take those things that we've held on to. You've given us the power to let go of through your spirit and you carry them away and you bury them so that we need not ever see them again. Those sins, those lusts, those things that were once pleasurable and appealing to us but are no longer because our hearts are full, filled with a love that's for you. Lord, may our hearts just be filled and overflowing with a love for you. You have such a great love toward us, O oh God. And we thank you for it. And we thank you for your son who gave his life for us so that we might live, we might be forgiven, that we can communicate with you that we can talk and walk with you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. In his name, amen. The Apostle Paul said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, just for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, be with your people, Lord. Give them the courage, give them the strength. Let them know where their power comes from to continue to go out and change and transform this world in your name, for your glory, for your honor. For, Lord, we pray for those who have not yet embraced and made that commitment. And, you know, they've heard of your love. They've heard the truth. They've even maybe perhaps known your cry and your sigh over them, Lord, but they haven't taken that step. They've been afraid to embrace it, Lord. Give them all the help they need to embrace it, Lord, and I pray that they would. Lord, maybe today is that day. Don't hesitate, friends. Just take that step. And um, I pray that we'll continue to be through any and all situations, Lord, your faithful servants. May we look to you for power and for strength. May we look to you for wisdom, discipline, and all that we need to carry on. We want to be those hands-on servants, Lord, but we can't do it without you. You make the difference. In Jesus' name, amen.